Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a wonderful Wednesday morning at Chem 1211 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, I have some important announcements. First of all, yesterday I found out, it was Monday, late Monday or yesterday, that what I was told about, and it was also on the um, uh, COD My Access description for this course, they had to take two tests in the final at COD. That has been changed. Uh, I have no control over this. And now you'll have to take all five tests plus the final at the testing center. Now, to be honest, I haven't worked out all the details yet because I'm still trying to set up a meeting. Uh, we've been playing tag on email when you're available. Uh, with the director of the testing center. Because the testing center is normally set up for just a couple of students from a class. But I'm going to have 24 people showing up to take tests. Now, what I will do is give you a window to go to the test center. And what I'm planning on, and I quote planning, I might change my mind, the week of a test, that Monday after our class, I will upload the test to, uh, or they'll get the test at the testing center. And the rest of that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you'll have to take the test, like test one coming up in a while. And I will pick them up Friday morning, about 10 a.m., and then grade them and I'll post the grades on Blackboard, the scores, and then I've got to work out how to get the test back to you. Hopefully, and this is a big if, big if, if I can swing it, I'll have your test at the um, reception desk for HSC, that's uh, our building where the chemistry department is on campus and you'll be able to just go there whenever they're open, I think from eight to five, uh, Monday through Friday, I don't know about Saturday. And again, this is a big if, I have to get it cleared, it may not, but somehow I'll get them back to you. All right, that's number one. Number two, one of your colleagues found an error, and I forgot which one, but when we go through it, I'll find it again on the, Chapter two, problem set answers. Guess what? I don't walk on water unless it's frozen. And even then I stay off. In other words, I'll make mistakes too. So once in a while, you'll catch them. You let me know, I'll let the whole class know and I appreciate it. Another important thing, this coming Monday, a week, uh, this Monday, coming up next week, at the beginning of our lecture, I will talk about and teach anybody who shows up a method I developed a number of years ago, how to eliminate test anxiety. Over the years, I've seen students who are good students and work hard. You sit them down for a test, whether it's in my classroom, testing center or wherever, and their brain goes all over the place. This, they get so nervous with anxiety that they don't do well on a test. Well, I've developed a method that eliminates it like that. Oh, it's broken today. That's better. Eliminates it like that. And I'll teach that. Example, last semester, I had a student in my 12-12 class who was first two tests, barely got Ds. And I finally was able to teach that student the method. Had a little barrier. But, and after that, got all high Bs, middle Bs, which is quite an improvement from barely passing the class with a D to getting a good solid B. I've seen other students go from Fs and Ds to As, and I will do that, teach you next Monday. However, I will cut it out, I like the special effects, <laughs> cut it out of the video, because I don't want it floating around Someday I may be able to sell it, maybe, but I'll do that. And if you can't make it on Monday, 
to see that and learn how to eliminate test anxiety, come to my office hours anytime and I'll be able to teach you. It takes about 10, 15 minutes, but it's worth it. All right, what's next on the list? All right. Let me get this over here. You all should have gotten or we'll get your Carolina lab kit. This is the one department get, got for me. What I like to do real quick, maybe a little somewhat real quick, is go through the things you should have in your kit, which is in my kit. You should have a balance. Make room here. You should have a syringe. You should have the chemistry safety set, gloves, goggles, and an apron. All right, you should have a packet that says investigate chemical reactions. It's got steel wool and some mystery in this green stuff. We'll have to find out during the semester. You should have a kit that says equilibrium, Le Chatelier's principle. I use the north side of Chicago accent. Uh oh, my little metal plate got. You should have a packet that says exploring physical and chemical changes. And if I'm going too fast, you can always go back and slow down the video. You should have one that says engineering a better airbag. You should have a little green bag that says small items enclosed. Should have a heavy box like this. There are washers in here and it says metal calorimetry. Another bag you should have says chemical set two. Ooh, heavy one, a lot of good stuff in here. You should have this big bag that says chemical set one. You should have a bag and I'll hold it up after I read the label. Faster, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. And it's from the commercial for this product. It should have said, oh, what a relief it is. A scientific method investigation. And it's got some, is it Alka-Seltzer? Yep. Ooh, a deck of cards that says period, period, periodicity, I've never used that word before, and the periodic table. So you should have this. I did chemistry set one. And the last thing you should have is principles of chemistry equipment set, including cups, Spoon, or spoons, eyedropper, a little candle, some way boats, and looks like, for some reason, a box. So those are all the things you should have in your kit. Please check. If you've ordered the correct kit, that's what you should have. Hold on while I try to get this all back in my box. Success, I got it all back in the box. All right, so like I said, go back and look at the video. I just, uh, of the video I'll post later today or tonight and check to make sure you have everything in your chem kit from 
Carolina, whatever company that makes it. Actually, this is a really good looking kit. Was it about a year and a half ago? We tried a kit from a company and it was, how should I do this very politely? Awful, awful. Oh, that reminds me, Ken White's story, Dr. White's story. At one company I worked for, we had the summer intern and she was the nicest, kindest person I've ever met in my life. And when she would get mad, which was rare, but if she did, she'd say, oh, that's awful. And if she got really mad, she'd say, oh, that's awful, awful. And she was just the kindest, sweetest person I've ever met in my life and a good summer intern that I hired. But anyways, that kit was awful, awful. This one I just showed you looks pretty good. All right, the next thing I'd like to do, and you can go back and look at the video to receive this again, is today I wanna teach you how to use the calculator. And you'll be needing to use the scientific calculator, the Texas TI-30X uh, solar. I've had this, I don't know how many years, at least eight or nine, maybe longer. And it's inexpensive, it works good, and it's easy to use. Hi, right. I see a question. All right. Uh, Michael, how do you receive it? Uh, you've got to buy it. And if you look at the email I sent you, or if you look at my syllabus, you can buy it from the bookstore. And what they'll do is they'll send you a voucher that you go to the website for the California company, www.carolina, not California, carolina.com. And there's you log in, you put in the uh voucher number. I've never done it myself personally because this is the department gets for me. And then they'll ship it to you to your home. And it comes in the box like I just showed you. Does that answer your question? Now I would do it ASAP as soon as possible. Next Tuesday we won't be using the kit. The week from this Tuesday you'll have to get the kit. And between that Tuesday and the following Tuesday, you'll have to do the lab at home on your own. If you have any questions, come always to my office hours and then upload the data for the and your answers to the lab report that will be on Blackboard, okay? That answer your question. You're welcome. Like I said, all questions are good questions. All right. This is going to be really high tech because I have not only this camera, but my second backup camera. Yes, Dr. White's a computer high tech person sometimes, like most of it. Hold on. Let me see some. Yep. All right. Let's do the following. Say you want to do this math, multiply 2.3 times 10 squared times 4.1 times 10 to the fifth. What do you do? Well, you get your calculator. Now, bear with me because I've got, I forgot to do something. Hold on one sec. What happens is when I'm um, going to switch to the other camera, I won't see this. So I wanted to write it down. 
All right, we're going to back up camera number two and we'll stop share. By the way, in case you're wondering, this is what I see, what I'm teaching. This is a desk I've had. By the way, that's my hobby desk over there. I'm into electronics. I'm also a flashlight collector, more electronics. All right, let's get to work. All right, here's your calculator. Let's turn it on. I'll clear it. Now, the first thing you need to do is second key. Then right here, it says SCI and other stuff. And with these keys, you want the letters SCI underline. Then you'll hit enter. That puts you in scientific notation. Again, second key right here, SCI, this thing, and you'll put the cursor and you can look at the video again. Now, to do the math we want to do, we're going to put in 2.3. Now, to get to exponential or the power of 10, blue key, and you'll see right here, double E above that. You'll press there, and you notice the letter E is there. I want two, so I'll press two. So if you notice, this is 2.3, E means times 10 to the second power. Next, I'm gonna multiply. So I'll go like this. See the star, now I want 4.1. Now, again, I want 10 to the fifth. So I'll do blue key, double E, and then I want five. And notice that's 4.1. E means times 10 to the, and the number after the E is five. And now I'll hit enter. Now, if you notice right here, it says 9.43, then they make it super small times 10 to the 0, 07. So the answer to that would be 2.43 times 10 to the 7. Correct. All right. Oh, I'm reading it upside down. I'm sorry, it's 9.43. My screen right here on my screen looks up slightly, you can't see it. Let's see if I can do this. Now, infinity mirror time, uh, you were right. Thank you, whoever corrected me. So if we go back here, the answer would be, and I'm not doing significant figures right now, and they have zero seven. Let's do another one. All right, first of all, always remember to clear. And now I want 4.23, and now it's times 10 to the sixth. Again, blue key, the second key, yours might be a different color, mine's blue, and then double E on this calculator. And notice I have the E up there. I want 10 to the sixth, so I'll hit the number six. And I have that. Now I want to multiply. I'll use this X. You'll see the star 2.11. And then I want 10 to the 7. Again, blue key, double E, which is the key above X to the minus 1. And now I want the number 7. 
and I'll hit enter. And the number I get here, again, we're not doing significant figures now, is 8.9253 times 10. Notice they got times 10, very tiny, and that's 10 to the 13th. This right here. And that's how you do multiplication. Division, you'll use this key. But before we do a division, let's do another one. I can actually write it here. I don't need my tablet for now. And let's do Now, if you notice here, I've got 8.15 times 10, now it's minus five, times 6.1 times 10 to the minus two. So let's, this is very important, pay attention. Clear it. We want 8.15 times 10 to the minus five. Again, to get to the times 10, blue key, double E. Now, this is important. Pay attention. When you have an exponent that's negative, you use this key right here. Do not use this key. This key on the side of the keypad is for minus subtraction. This key with a bracket, minus bracket, close bracket, is for powers of 10 minus. So I'm going to press that. And you'll see I have a minus sign after the E. And now I'll put in 5. So now I have 8.15 times 10 to the minus 5. Again, to get a minus power of 10, you use this key, not this key. Again, oh, I'll use my pencil. This key, oh, I'm getting super fancy now. I'm also being obnoxious, sorry. But anyways, you use this key and not this key. Always for 10 to the minus, use the bracket minus bracket on the keyboard. And now we want to multiply it by And notice I get the star 6.1 times 10 to the minus 2. So now I'll go blue key or second key, double E. But now I want a minus sign again. Use this, not this. Use this. I'll say it again. Use this. And notice I now have a minus sign there. And I want two. So I now have 6.1 times 10 to the minus two. I'll hit enter. And now the number I get is, I hold the camera so you can see it, four point, let me write it down, 9715 times 10. Now notice right here, there's a minus sign. You can sometimes miss it, but you shouldn't. And that'd be times 10 to the minus six. And again, I'm not doing significant figures. And here would be your answer. 4.9715 times 10 to the minus six. Again, the key, when you need a minus X, use this key, not this. Again, use this key, not this. Now, Anna, the reason you're getting that, you're not in scientific notation. What you need to do, all right, Anna, what you need to do, first of all, let me clear it. I'll tell you what, if you have a different calculator than what I have, come to my office hour and I can help you out. There hasn't been a calculator yet that I haven't figured out. Some of the real older fancy ones, yeah, it takes me a couple minutes to find everything. Hopefully you have a webcam that you can show me your 
calculator like this. But the problem is you have to look into your instruction manual how to put your calculator into scientific notation. Mine is, and this is why I like this one, simple, blue key, then where it says SCI slash ENG engineering, click that and see how it has flow SCI engineering. You can pick either one. You want to be an SCI. All right, let's do one more. Let's do a division. All right, I'm just picking these at random, 7.12 times 10 to the fifth divided by 2.113 times 10 squared. And you may have to do this type of calculation. So first of all, I always make sure I'm cleared, I am. So the first number that's on top that you're gonna divide into, I'll put in, 7.12. Now we want times 10 to the fifth. Focus, please. There we go. Blue key, double E. And because it's five, we just hit the number five. And notice we have 5.12 times E is times 10 to the fifth. Now, when we want to divide, you do this key. And notice you'll see, if I get the, the slash there for division, and what are we going to divide it by? 2.113. Now, notice who I want times 10 squared. So again, I'll do blue key, or your second key, double E. And I want the number two. So I'll click on that. And notice I have 2.113 E2 times 10 to the square. I'll hit enter. And this is why you round off. My calculator gives me 3.36961665959 times 10. And remember, don't forget that times 10, zero, three, you don't have to put the zero there, 10 to the third, which is this answer right here. Now in real life, and let me do one right now, while I've got you here, 7.12 is three significant figures, 2.114 is four significant figures, Therefore, the lower number is this, three. So I have to round this off to three significant figures. Keep the three, keep the three, keep the six. Use nine to round off. That's five or higher. So everything else I'll drop and increase this by right. So on my test, the correct answer for this would be 3.36 times 10 to the third. But again, for division, use this key. For multiplication, you'd use this. We're not gonna do any really much subtraction and zero, I think in this class. Later on, I think you all know how to do addition. Uh, we don't do addition in my class with um, scientific notation. You can, but we don't in this class. Now let's do one more. All right, next one, if you can see it, hopefully you can. 3.201 
times 10 to the minus fifth divided by 8.002 times 10 to the minus two. So let's go back. Again, I always, even if I don't have to, I still, it's my SOP. SOP means standard operating procedure. I want to put in the top number I'm going to divide into 3.201. Wait a second. 3.201. Then I want 10 to the minus fifth, second key, double E. And now since I want minus, use this key, not that one, use this one, minus, and I see the minus, and I want five, and that's 3.201, E is times 10 to the minus five, and I'm gonna divide by, 8.002, then I want times 10. So I'm gonna do blue key, second key, double E, and then I want minus two, again, for negative X, X on 10 to the power, use this key. You notice I'll never be a nail uh, model on TV. And there, it's now minus, and I want two, and now I'll hit enter. And the number my calculator gives me, I'm laughing because all the significant figures it threw at me. It's 4.00024993. Now, here's the important thing. Let me get the camera angle right. Notice it's times 10, and be sure to remember to see that minus sign, minus 0, 04. And that would be what my calculator does. I got this here. This is four significant figures. This is four significant figures. And I'll round this off to four significant figures. Keep the four, keep the zero, keep the zero, keep the two. That's my four. The one to round off is four. That's four or less. I'll drop it. So the correct answer on my test would be, on, focus. 4.002 times 10 to the minus four. Did I make a mistake somewhere? Let me take a look. Ah, yes, I made a mistake writing it down. So actually, that should be this. So that would be dropped. So it'd be 4.000 times 10 to the minus fourth. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Thank you, Alexis. All right. And again, if you want to see my inner sanctum, what I see when I'm teaching, by the way, if you haven't guessed, Dr. White loves the color red. And hopefully that was helpful to you. Aren't you glad I have not one, but two? Actually, I got an older webcam too. I never use anymore but I bought two because one's an emergency backup if my main one up here doesn't uh, ever has a problem. It hasn't for two and a half years, almost two years now I've been using it.
All right, any questions on how to use a calculator? If you have any problems, uh, let me just shut this off. And if you got this one or a different one, come to my office hour on either Monday or Wednesday night. And today is Wednesday, so actually not night, late evening. I guess that's late, late afternoon from 5 to 6.15. If you can't make it and you really, really need help, email me and I'll see if we can set up a Zoom meeting where I can help you out with the calculator. All right, practice. Practice using the calculator. You'll see chapter two problems have some practice problems for you to use your calculator. You need it for test number one, two, three, four, five, and the final. All right. Uh, one thing I will do when I talk to the testing center, I'll allow them to let you use your calculator. You can set it up where they give you one, and I wouldn't like that because now you're using a calculator you're not familiar with. All right. Oh, excuse me. Any questions? I'm looking at the chat at the bottom of my monitor. Look at my collar. That should be straight. It is now. All right. It's time for a special uh, commercial from Dr. White. All right, thumbs up people. Do you see elements that you should learn? Chemical symbols on your screen, thank you. And it's time for Dr. White to be subtle. Isn't it amazing how subtle I can be? Hint, you should know this. You should know only these 37 elements from the periodic table. And I'll teach you later on what the periodic table is. So I'm asking you to learn. And those are these 37. And what you should know is if on a test, I ask what's the chemical symbol for zinc, you should know it's ZN. If I ask, what's the name of the element HG's chemical symbol? That's mercury. If I ask you, it's a good one, draw the chemical symbol for nitrogen, it's N. If I ask you, what compound, what element, not compound, what element has the chemical symbol AR, and it's argon. And by the way, I used a lot of argon when I was doing my PhD thesis. So I'm, it's a good friend of mine. I see a question. The answer is no, Jasmine. <laughs> uh, let me show you, let me see. Let's do something real quick. Again, I've cut down on memorization. Well, thank you, Anna. The ones I use, yes, I know the atomic number and atomic weights, but I've been using them a few months more than you, maybe a few years. How about a few decades? Yeah, that's true too. All right, let me, thank you. All right, let's go to the internet.
No, that's not what I want. If you go to course information, go to lectures, and let's see if you're seeing me do this. You'll see very at the very top periodic table PDF. Let's click on that. Let me download it. All right. Now, what you should do, uh, control shift plus. Control plus, all right. I forgot how to rotate this. But anyways, uh, it's been a while since I've used this. So, uh, oh, I know why, hold on. Now, no, what am I, why am I not going into, ah. For some reason, no. All right, let me try something. There we go. I don't know why it wouldn't open up. All right, let's see if you can see what I can see. All right, now let's try this. You do control shift plus, you rotate it. Does everybody see the periodic table? Thank you. You will be given this for each test. And it has on there everything except the name of the element. That's because you've got to learn it. And you should know H is hydrogen, Li lithium, Na sodium, O oxygen, carbon C. And that's why you need to know that. This you'll be given test one, two, three, four, five. And no, the ACS, they don't give you one. They have it in the booklet if you need it. I don't think they have names in there too, but I haven't seen that test in a number of years. And they may have a newer one. So anyways, let's get back to my public service announcement. That's the wrong one. That's the right one. All right, everybody see the elements you should know on your screen? Thank you, Alexis. You need to memorize this. Well, you don't need to, but you're going to have a hard time doing all the tests in the final if you don't know these 37. I don't ask you to learn the rest of them because I've never used them most of the time. But these are important ones. Cu copper, Ag silver, Au gold, Ni nickel, Fe iron, calcium Ca, magnesium Mg, and so on. Xenon. Oh, by the way, KR is Krypton. And as I said on Monday, unless I've been kidnapped to another universe, I don't think so. Uh, Krypton in our universe is a colorless gas at room temperature, not a green solid that kills Superman. Sorry to pop that bubble for you, but it doesn't. All right. Now on Monday, I was talking about the prefixes you should know for the metric system. And even though I have a nice list here that are in our daily life, like mega, how many are familiar heard? How many megabytes of memory do you have? That's 10 to the sixth, a million. And you might have a Where's one? I don't have one at hand right now. 
All right, where'd I hide it? Anyways, you might have a thumb drive and it has space for how many gigabytes? And that's a billion. And now they have, and if you look over my shoulder, I don't have it on the list. These are external hard drives. Yes, I'm a power user. And those are terabyte. I think one's eight, one's 10, one's 12. Wow, I've got 30 terabytes of hard drive and I'm filling those up. I do a lot of video stuff and other stuff. Plus there's more electronics. Well, you're getting to see all my cool stuff. All right, but seriously, let's go back to the list. On this list, you should know that kilo prefix is a thousand tenth and a third. That centi, like in centimeter, is 10 to the minus two. And that milli is 10 to the minus three. Those are the only three I'm asking you to learn, but you should know those. So if I ask on a test, what does milli mean? You should know it's 10 to the minus three. What's kilo? 10 to the third, a thousand. All right, let's move on. Now, if you look in your book, if you bought the book, you'll see a section in this chapter on problem solving. And it, they, they call it problem solving. I forgot what others use, but I call it unit analysis. And what unit analysis is, is a general problem solving method in which units associated with numbers are used as a guide in setting up calculations. Everybody take a deep breath, let it out. <laughs> take a deep breath, let it out. Are you nice and relaxed? We're gonna do some math, relax. We're even gonna do some algebra, really relax. Come on, relax. I'll teach you how to do that. When we do that, Unit analysis will be your good buddy, your good friend. In fact, when I'm doing that, I'll say it's time to use unit analysis. <laughs> your good buddy, <laughs> your good friend. And unit analysis has been my good buddy and good friend for many, 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 many years. In high school, when I took AP chemistry in my high school, I still remember him and I'll be forever grateful. Mr. Solners, who was our teacher, taught us unit analysis. I mean, big time, beat it into our head. And unit analysis, you'll find out later on, is your good buddy, your good friend. But it makes no sense to teach it right now because it'll be a couple of weeks until we'll be doing some math. Relax, it won't be that bad. And with that, it's time for a break. I'm going to take a five minute break, get up and stretch. You can too, or whatever. I'll be back in five minutes to continue our Wednesday lecture. See you in five.
Time to get going. Welcome back. Turn on your webcam so I can see real people. All right, I was talking about unit analysis, and I'll teach you this later when we need it, when you'll need it. And like I said, this has been my good buddy, my good friend, and it's unit analysis for many, 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 many years. And you'll find, oh, I saw a real person. I didn't mean to turn it on, sorry. You, no, you can turn it on. You have nothing to be sorry about. Just everybody, I don't know why, because of the pandemic uh, or whatever, a lot of students are shy to see. Hold on, you can't see me now. No. <laughs> but anyways, let's move on. Now, the next thing I like to talk about is in the chapter is called density. And for this, for my class, I'm going to turn the switch, click. Will this be on a test? No. But it's still an important thing to know about. Might be on the ACS test, and I'll go over it right before the final. All right. What is density? And again, I won't ask anything like this on a test. I think we do do a lab on this. Density is the ratio of mass of an object, otherwise known as the weight, to the volume of that ob object. And therefore, density is mass divided by volume. I have here C problems. Let me do this. We're not going to really do problems. But what I do want to talk about Now, if I could use cursive, I would have been done writing this already, but I can't. So hang in there. Oh, come on, eraser, kick in. I'll be done by the end of the week. One of these days I'll have this in my slides. All right, this won't be on a test, but it's good for your daily life to think about this. Lower density objects or liquids float on top of higher density liquids. And higher density objects or liquids sink when put in lower density liquids. So what does that mean? Uh-oh, warning, Dr. White artwork. I should warn you, I have no inkling of ever going to art school or never did. My mother was a very good amateur artist. My father was a very good amateur carver, artist doing carvings. None of that, zero rubbed off on Dr. White. But I should warn you, when I'm drawing things on the whiteboard, don't hurt yourself laughing too hard. All right, let's say you have a, 
a barrel of water. And water, which I'll teach you later, is H2O. And in here, if you put a cannonball, made of iron, what happens? Will it float or will it sink? Well, how do you know what to do or how to figure that out? Now, if you go to your favorite search engine, mine's Google. I've been using it since about a week after it came out. I think it was 95 or 96. A friend of mine called me up and said, you got to check this out. <laughs> I was astounded by Google back then. And still am, it's helpful. And the density of iron is 7.874 grams per cubic millimeter. And that same thing as milliliter. Now, if we do the same thing for water, I already know that number. It's say have one, it's actually 1.01, but let's call it one. And it matters on the temperature too, but one. So iron is about eight. Water is one. What's going to happen to that cannonball? It's going to sink right to the bottom. And that's because the density of iron is the greater than the density of water. Now, let's say we have a bottle. And in this bottle, we have water. And now, we're gonna put in there some vegetable oil. What will happen to the vegetable oil? Will it sink or will it float? And if you notice vegetable oil has a density of about 0.9. And therefore, water is greater and the vegetable oil, if you put it in here, will float on the top. Now, how many of you ever seen by a swimming pool or say a lifeguard stand on a beach you see that big ring to help people if they're drowning. And the old rings, I don't know about the new ones, but the old ones from long ago had cork in them. And why did they put cork in a ring like that? Because the density of cork is 0 0.35 grams per milliliter which means it's a lot lighter than water density, so it will float on water. And that's why the old rings, I think now they might use urethane, I don't know, I'm just guessing now. But again, they have a material in there that has a density less than water, so when you throw it on there, it helps. Now, one thing I haven't done in a while, let's see if we can find it. Now, the density of a human body is about 1.1, the two significant figures, which is why if you go into a pool and you do nothing, you sink because you're more dense than water. So that's all I need to ask. Actually, you need to know about density 
I will never ask you on a test to calculate it or anything like that. And time for a public service announcement again. Don't forget, start learning these 37 elements. Know the name and the symbol, Li lithium, Na sodium, Ne neon. Oh, I know these, Cl, one of my favorite. Chlorine, oh, is a real favorite of mine. Oxygen, and these you should know. Oh, PT, I've used platinum and PD, palladium. And I nickel, I've used a lot of that when I was in industry as a catalyst. I'll teach you later on what's a catalyst. All right. So that's density. And the thing to remember is lower density objects float on top of higher density liquids, higher density objects sink when put into lower density liquids. And as you can see, the cannonball sunk, the uh, vegetable oil and olive oil, you could use too, as a lower density than water will sink, stay on the top. How many of you have ever seen a bottle of oil vinaigrette dressing? And the vinaigrette vinegar is mainly water and the oil is usually vegetable oil and if you let it sit there'll be two layers the bottom layer will be the water top layer will be the oil and if you happen to be with friends neighbors or loved ones this weekend and they have a bottle of say my mother's favorite was wishbone i've learned how to make it myself which is much better than anything you can buy, you can say, look, that's because of the difference in densities. Water has a higher density than a vegetable oil. Don't do that. You'll lose a lot of friends, neighbors, and loved ones. People don't like hearing chemistry during dinner, lunch, or break. Well, you wouldn't use salad dressing in breakfast. Well, you could. All right, let's get back to chapter two. And uh-oh, if you look at the bottom left of your screen, you see we're on page 22 of 22. That means we're done with chapter two. So before we go on to a new chapter, let me make the following announcement. This Tuesday, before we do our lab, which will be a safety lab, you don't need the kit for this coming Tuesday, but you will need it for about a week from this Tuesday. So if you haven't ordered it, get it. It's, it's in my syllabus or the email I sent out uh, where to buy the kit from. Now, what we'll do all semester, uh, Michael, in terms of exams, all right, let's take a second or two. All questions are good questions. All my exams, not the ACS that I have no hand in, that's some that's the American Chemical Society made that, but my five tests, uh, I usually put a few multiple choice. I, as I've said the first day, at least I think I did, I teach by my golden rule of teaching. What's that? I don't do to students what I didn't like done to me. And luckily when I was a student, multiple choice tests were rare. Like I didn't take any, I don't think I ever did in high school or college, or if there were a few questions, the only ones you took were the ACT and SAT. And I didn't do as good as I could have if they had been written out tests. But anyways, I'll have a few multiple choice, but most of my tests are like, you'll find out after test number one, like the problem set practice problems. I call them practice problems for a reason. And, and that's what my tests will look like. My tests are, first of all, you'll have a few, like maybe no more than 10 points usually, 
like about five or six multiple choice on some of the tests, not all of them. And then the rest will be write out an answer or do a calculation to figure an answer. And I will show you how to do that. I've mentioned it, but I'll mention it again. Every question on my test, I've covered the concept how to do that question at least twice, usually a lot more. Also, my test, and at the testing center, since it's going to be not the best environment, some students have said, some don't matter. I'll give you, normally, if we were face-to-face -face in a classroom, you'd have 50 to 55 minutes to finish it. I'll give you about an hour and a half at the testing center. Again, either you know it or you don't. However, my tests are designed, if you have done the practice problems, what's this here? Yeah. Uh-oh, beard dandruff. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> if you have done the practice problems and studied, which you have to do the practice problems, my test, which I'll give you if we we're face-to-face, 50, 55 minutes, most students are done in about 35, 40 minutes, the majority. I don't write a test because I don't like, I go by my golden rule. I don't do to my students what I didn't like done to me. If you've ever had a teacher who writes a test that only the best student can barely finish it, which was usually in math and science, me, and the rest of them didn't have enough time. Uh, 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 that's wrong, wrong, wrong. I never do that. However, that statement is made with the caveat, you've done the practice problems on your own. If you can do the practice problems on your own, get the right answers, you're in good shape and you'll do good on my test. Does that help? Uh-oh, am I, hold on. Can you hear me now? Someone said they couldn't hear anything. Test, test. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. <laughs> I love this. By the way, this is made by a company in Germany that's no longer, and they don't make them this quality anymore. I've got four of them. They don't leave my house ever because <laughs> you can't get them. I've had friends. Can I have one? No. <laughs> All right. Does that answer everything about my... All right, my test, and before test each test, I will send out an email. And on in the email, I will tell you, one, how many pages there are. Two, how many problems. Also, three, how many problems are multiple choice. Now, sometimes some of my problems are multiple part, like A, B, C, and D. And so, and I'll say that. I'll also tell you how many points are in each area that we covered and the total number of points. First test, it's 100. I think the test, second test, I put a bonus uh, problem, so there'll be 105. So it'll be five bonus points. But this is a harder test. Test one, uh, ooh, that reminds me, first of all, water break. Test number one of the whole semester, this class is always the highest average, which means it's the easiest. You should study like you need every point for every test, but especially test number one, because it's the easiest to get the most points and your final grade is based on how many points you get. So you should be doing the practice problems. Now, does that answer everybody's questions about tests? You're welcome, Michael. All right. Now, let me say again, I think I was about to say, this semester, after we finish a chapter, the following lab period, I will go through the practice problems. Not all of them, but I'll pick a couple. And if you're here, hopefully you will be, 
uh, I'll do any ones you want me to do. And you should do the practice problems before I do. And then if you need help in the la on Tuesdays, when I do that, you can ask, what did I do wrong? Or show me, show everybody, including myself, how to do it. So what that means is we just finished chapter two. Yay, we're moving along. And on Tuesday, beginning of the period, I will go through chapter two practice problems. And you should do them. Also, one other thing, you're welcome. Uh, I should point out, wait until I finish a chapter before you do the chapter problems. Again, wait until I finish your chapter until you do the chapter problems. That way you'll learn what I've taught you and then you can do them. All right. So if we're done with chapter two, you know what that means? It's new chapter time. Let's go on to chapter three. Did I tell you I can be a wild and crazy guy on Zoom? And let me just close chapter two. All right, everybody see chapter three. Thumbs up, people. Thank you. All right, chapter three, if we're following in the book, which I do, but I add more stuff and make it easier for you to learn, hopefully, deals with matter and energy. And remember, chemistry is the investigation of matter, how it reacts, and other aspects of matter. Well, what's matter? Well, matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. Anything that has mass or occupies space. Now, mass refers to the amount of matter present in a sample. And since I also asked the other day, is anybody going to be leaving the planet before the end of the semester? And nobody was. You can also interchange the word weight. So another way of saying that, what is matter? Anything that has weight and occupies space, which means we matter. Oh, that was bad. Uh, sorry. Well, if you think about it, the plastic here is matter. My water inside my bottle is matter. The paper is matter. So anything that occupies space and has mass is matter. All right. Next, I'd like to talk about the physical states or states of matter. And oops, it's time for Dr. White to be subtle. Everybody get the message? Let's talk about the three physical states of matter. The first one is solid. And you should know, first of all, what is one of the physical states of matter? It's a solid. You should also know what is a solid. It's something that has definite shape and definite volume and is incompressible. A most important thing from that is it has definite shape and definite volume. And if you look right here, I have a nice little piece of plastic and this has definite shape and definite volume. And I can't compress it either. So this is a solid. I like red if you haven't guessed by now. It's a special type of plastic that the light comes out the edges. But anyways, 
a solid has definite shape and definite volume. If you look at a piece of gold at room temperature, like my ring, it's a solid because it has definite shape, definite volume. All right, the next state of physical state of matter is a liquid. And a liquid has indefinite shape, but definite volume and is incompressible. But don't worry about the incompressible part. Oh, what's this indefinite shape? Well, let's take a look at this. Here I have water. And if you notice, you, from your experience, it's a liquid. But what makes it a liquid? Well, notice the water in this bottle, and if I tip it upside down, takes the shape of the container. If I were to pour my water into my teacup, which I won't because I'll dilute my tea, the water would take the shape of my cup instead of, of the battle, bottle. Therefore, it has indefinite shape. Whatever shape the container you put a liquid in, the liquid will take that shape, whether it's in a bottle or my mug here. Notice customize, DRKW, me. But anyways, ooh, one of the things I've always looked for and I haven't seen, if anybody ever sees a square glasses, you know, for drinking, water or whatever, let me know. I'd like to get a set of those. That'd be cool. But most of the time you'll see they're not, they're round. But anyways, a liquid takes the shape of the container, meaning it has indefinite shape, but I can measure the amount, meaning the volume of the water in this bottle. When it was full, it was 710 milliliters. Obviously, I've drunk some, so it's not full. And finally, the third physical state of matter is a gas. And a gas has indefinite shape, indefinite volume. Ooh, well, we know what indefinite shape is it will take the shape of whatever container you put it in. What's this indefinite volume? Well, if I had a small container of say, the gas that smells like a rose, if I took the tap off the container, the gas would come out and start expanding and it would fill the volume of my room. So if I were sitting here and I took it over, opened this, whatever was in that container that's a gas, that had a nice odor, I wouldn't use a skunk odor, eh, no. And you were standing by the door, in a little while, you would smell it. Why? Because the gas has indefinite volume, it would start expanding and expanding, how you like special effects, and you'd be able to smell it by my door. So let's get back. Let's look at what are the three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, I even have type, hint, know this. Well, I don't have this. Let me fix this. There. All right, now if we were in a classroom, I'd say class all together. What are the three states of matter? You don't have to turn on your microphone, but if you're home right now, say it out loud with me, but you don't have to turn on your microphone. The three states of matter. The first one, solid. Second one, come on, everybody, liquid. And the last one, gas. Again, let's do it one more time. And I would told the students, come on, it's beginning of semester. Let me hear you. And they say it louder, which is fun for me to hear. And the students enjoy it too. And hopefully you will. If you're at watching this video, everybody, along with me, what are the three states of matter, physical states of matter? The first one, solid. The second one, liquid. And the final one, gas. 
And you should know a solid has definite shape, definite volume. A liquid has indefinite shape, definite volume. And a gas has indefinite shape, indefinite volume. And if I were to ask on a test, if you have a compound in a box and it has definite shape and definite volume, what physical state of matter is? And the answer is a solid. And those are the type of questions I could ask. So again, hint, know this. You should know the three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and you should know a solid has definite shape, definite volume, a liquid has indefinite shape, definite volume, and finally, a gas has indefinite shape and definite volume. And if you haven't figured out by now, I'll tell you, we're surrounded by gas. The air you breathe is a gas because it has indefinite shape and indefinite volume. Now, when we talk about matter, and Switch has been on for all this, and we're gonna, you're gonna learn some definitions, and yes, there is some memorization. You should know when it comes to matter, there are different types of matter. The first type is a pure substance, and you should know this. I'm not gonna write hint, you should know this, but you should. And what is a pure substance? It's a single kind of matter that can't be separated into other kinds of matter by any physical means. And example of that is something that's composed of only one type of atom or molecule. There's only one substance present. And if this water were pure, it's not unfortunately, drinking water is not totally pure, but if you had totally pure water, it would only contain H2O, water, nothing else. And if I had totally pure gold, that would only have gold atoms in it. If you had a bar of gold that's totally pure, it's pure substance, it would have this gold. Same thing with silver. So a pure substance is made up of either one type of atom or molecule, and I'll teach you later on what's an atom or molecule. Now, you have pure substance, and you can also have mixtures. And what is a mixture? That's a physical combination of two or more substances, meaning atoms or molecules, in which each substance retains its own chemical identity. When you mix two things together, that's why it's called mixture, they each stay the same or in all the things you're mixing together, they don't react and change. And a mixture has two or more substances present. So a mixture, unlike a pure substance, has two or more substances combined together. Well, and if I ask on a test, give an example of a mixture, ooh, what could you use? The air you're breathing. The air you're breathing is a complex mixture, but it's mainly oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules. I bet you didn't think when you're breathing, you're inhaling a mixture. Now, what would be another example of a mixture? Well, my tea is a mixture of a lot of things. Water, I put some sugar in there, things that come out of the tea leaf, a bunch of chemicals are in the water that give it the taste, in this case, of blueberry tea. Now, what would be another one that's a mixture? Well, next time you drive by a gas station, the gasoline they sell is a very complex uh, mixture. All right, Alexis asks, could a mixture be CO2, carbon dioxide? Well, if it's just carbon dioxide alone, 
then that would be a pure substance. If you just have a container of carbon dioxide, which you can, or a solid, how many of you have ever seen dry ice? You know, it's that real cold white stuff. And that's carbon dioxide, pure carbon dioxide. But CO2 mixed with other things, like, let's get personal, when you exhale, coming out of your breath, that's one way your body gets rid of carbon as carbon dioxide. Wow, you learn a lot of great things. I bet you didn't realize when you exhale, you're exhaling molecules that's a mixture. Because when you exhale, you have nitrogen, I think some oxygen, and then carbon dioxide. Hold on. I don't know if we can find anything real quick. Now you see a PhD in action. When there's a question, find the answer. I didn't know this exact numbers, but notice when you exhale from your lungs, assuming this is correct, and not for now, assume it is, is 78% nitrogen gas, 17% oxygen gas, and 4% carbon dioxide, which is a mixture because each one of these retains its own identity. Wow, even Dr. White learns things in my class. I did. What are the other mixtures? Well, if you brushed your teeth today, your toothpaste is a mixture. If you use mouthwash, and I do, uh, that's a mixture. If you went downstairs and opened your refrigerator, and looked at the melt, the ketchup, the mustard. Those are all mixtures. So mixtures play an important part in our life. So when we talk about matter, you can have a pure substance or a mixture. Now, when we talk about pure substances, you can talk about an element. And what is an element? And I won't ask what's an element, but you should be familiar. It's a pure substance that cannot be broken down into simple, simpler substances by, and here's this important, chemical or physical beings. Again, an element cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical or physical beings. So, if we take a look at that, what would be an example? Well, the gold in my ring, my college ring, and the atoms that make up this are pure, an element, the gold. I can't take gold and break it down into any other elements or substances. And therefore, it's an element. Another example would be silver. Oxygen atoms, we're breathing oxygen gas, but oxygen atoms, you can't. Same thing with carbon. If you have a diamond, this isn't. Uh, you can't break that down into smaller elements or other substances. Now, the other type of pure substance is a compound. Now, compound is a pure substance that can be broken down into two or more simpler substances. And therefore, it's a compound. Now, what would be an example of a compound? Ooh, wrong color. I only use red for special announcements.
water. Pure water can be broken down to hydrogen oxygen. And it's a compound. What's another compound example? Now this is, and I don't do non-cursive that well. Like I said, that's Cl right here. So learn how I write Cl. And sodium chloride is table salt. And that can be broken down into sodium and chlorine. Don't do it. Chlorine gases and sodium is are very dangerous substances, but it can be. Oh, it's time to tell, do I have time? Oh, I do, just barely. Sodium chloride. If you ever go out to breakfast, lunch, or dinner with chemists, and I have to admit, I've been guilty of this many times with going out with other chemists, one of us will say, can you please pass the knackle at a restaurant? Sodium chloride, knackle, you can grow now. But anyways, this is a compound. It's pure, but it's still a compound because you can break it down to other substances. So there are a lot of substances. Uh, let's do one more, uh, two more. Right now, you're breathing one of the substances is oxygen gas. And this can be broken down to oxygen atoms. And the same thing, nitrogen gas. And later on, I'll explain what the two means if you don't know when we talk about chemical formulas. All right, so these are pure substances. They can be an element or a compound. Now, when it comes to mixtures, which we already talked about, where two or more substances are present, they don't own, lose their own identity. There are two types. Well, I don't have it here. Ooh. I have to add the slide, it must have fallen off. Well, if I look at the clock, instead of going on to physical chemical properties, oh, let me just do this one more slide. All right, when we talk about matter, there's physical and chemical properties. And properties, and I'll never ask you what is a physical or chemical property definition, are characteristics to distinguish one substance from another. And now if I look at the clock, you're going to have to wait till Monday to learn about that. All right, listen carefully. Next Tuesday, I will go through the chapter two problem set, some of the problems. I don't do all of them, but if you show up, uh, I will do any you ask me to do. Also, Monday, at the beginning of the class, I will teach the method I developed years ago that's been quite successful for a lot of students, how to eliminate test anxiety. However, I will cut it out of the video. If you can't make it Monday, please feel free to come to my office hours. Speaking about which, tonight, from 5 to 6.15 on Zoom, remember it's a different login, look at the syllabus, I will have my office hour, actually hour and 15 minutes, and if you have any questions, come on by, say hello, and I'll answer them. And with that, I'm done. And I'll say, like my grandmother always said to me, in Yiddish, gangazun means going to hell, so I'll say gangazun, then what I stole from Granny of the Beverly Hillbillies TV show. Bye now. I'll see you on Monday. Have a nice rest of the weekend. Weekend. Don't forget if you haven't gotten it, order and purchase and order your chem kit from Carolina Company.
with that, I'm done. Gang is on. Bye.